All right, well, it's noon. Let's get going. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Hanawalb, the uh, assistant head of school here at One Schoolhouse for professional development and new programs. And I have two of my colleagues here with me. Um, and we are going to talk about student support planning really with a strategic approach towards next year. So Beta and Liz, thank you so much for being here with me today. I really appreciate it. So I'll do a little housekeeping first and then we'll get going. Just as a reminder, we'll use the chat to share resources with each other if you've got something to offer. And if you've got a question for Beta and Liz, please put it in the Q&A and we will definitely get to questions today because I know that there are lots of us um, wondering about how we're gonna support our students next year. So on our blog right now, we have co-authored by Beta and Liz. Uh, a four key student support strategies. And of course, we'll be sharing some analysis and some in-depth conversation about those as well here. And I'll put the link into the chat after we get going. And then next week's webinar, Keeping Kids Close When They Go Far. And that is gonna be an interview with Liz, you're coming back. <laughs> oh, you're muted. <laughs> I will be back, yes, and unmuted. <laughs> So there we go. That's all we can ask, right? So while we're doing that, actually, uh, next slide, would you mind sharing a little bit about some new offerings that we have this year at One Schoolhouse or this coming school year? Sure. So as we talked to schools about next year, one of the things that we heard was that it was not uncommon for schools to have a small number of students, sometimes one or two, sometimes 10 or 12, um, who were saying that they, even with the advances that we've been making, they just weren't comfortable being back on campus or couldn't be back, but they wanted to stay a part of the school community. So um, in response to that, we've expanded our course offerings so that um, any student grades nine through 12 mm -hmm. is able to take a full course load with us for, um, and, uh, for the year. And so if you're interested in that or you have students who are looking for that, um, maybe it's even you're a consortium school and you're even interested in just the fall semester, please give me or Beta a call. We're happy to talk through what the options are. Great. Thank you for sharing that. And then of course, we have our advanced independent curriculum, which I must bring up every week because I'm so excited about this and we're getting some great response and we've got summer PD that is filling up, but there's room to join us. So I hope that you'll get your copy. And then we've also got summer professional learning with uh, a course called Reflect, Renew and Restore, which is completely asynchronous so that folks can take it when it's convenient for them. And then we've got a course that we've offered several times, which always gets rave reviews, and that is Building Trust with Lori Palco, who will be here in just a couple of weeks uh, to do a webinar. So I'll drop a blog post that she wrote into the chat too. So every week we ask a Pulse question. We wanna know what's on your mind with a certain topic. And this week's Pulse question was related directly to this webinar. So what structures are you either continuing next year? Are you expanding? What are you gonna to do to support students in the coming year? And we have some preliminary results. So the two sort of big ones are enhanced advising to help students build their connection to the school, to the community, to each other, and then wellness SEL programming, expanding that. And then there are some other choices on there too that schools are considering. Um, I'm interested in that 41% are looking at a later start time for extra sleep. I know that I have teenagers and that would be very popular in my house. So I'm gonna stop sharing and get us going. So thank you so much for coming and sorry about that. And I'll put the links in. So today we're here to talk about student support in the coming months and the next academic year. So we expected a large crowd and we've got quite a few people here. So Beta, as the director of student support for One Schoolhouse and as a longtime independent school administrator, how have you seen awareness of the importance of student support change during your career and then also particularly this year? Thanks, Sarah. I appreciate uh, having the opportunity to be here today. I know that student support and our students' well being has uh, always been one of the driving factors of why we work in independent education. But this year, this past 15 months, has just made it so significant. In my time, I think that we have seen everything from 
schools, maybe if you're, you're in a K-12 or a six through 12, go from uh, perhaps having one counselor that was in uh, both divisions for middle school and upper school to uh, schools bringing in another counselor. And that has been a huge help for, for students um, and for managing the needs of our students as well. And uh, the other thing that I think that I've seen a lot of is actually following on what the polling just said, is that schools have been trying to build up really robust advisory programs, and that has been uh, a focal point for some schools to make sure that students have someone who is there that they can easily access, as well as building into an advisory program specifically, um, some SEL programming that has really um, kind of cranked up a notch over the last, I would say five to 10 years in schools. Um, and so it's it's certainly different from when I started to, to where we are today. And some schools take it a step farther and actually put it into their academic curriculum, not just in the advisory program. Oh, great. Well, thank you. Um, so Liz, when you and I were planning today's webinar, we decided that our thesis would be School may be fully open next year, but the the implications for students' mental health are, it's not over. There's some more fallout here. And just last week, we were talking about resilience and how our school communities would be demonstrating resilience throughout the coming year. There's a common misconception that resilience is only demonstrated during a crisis, but it's really after the crisis. And we're going to need to shore up and nurture resilience in our students throughout this coming school year. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, when when you look at what the um, the mental health fallout has been for the past for, for our students, it's been really um, it's been really significant that teens have different needs this year than they have in previous years. Um, so just, you know, um, there was a survey that uh, some statistics that came out um, just about two months ago um, and what um, what they about teen mental health and what they found was that 46 percent of parents of teens said that their children had had um, new or worsening mental health issues since the start of the pandemic. Um, 36 percent of parents of girls said they'd seen an increase in anxiety. 19 percent of parents of boys. Um, depression was similar, 31% for girls, 18% for boys, um, about 20, a little over 20% had negative changes in sleep, um, about 15% were withdrawing from families. There are very real quantifiable mental health impacts for teens um, that, that are emerging from the pandemic. And, you know, the truth is, is that there are not a lot of clinical comparisons to this, um, to what's happened. And what we know is also that uh, adverse life um, events in youth have long, what we, this is, and this is, this is true just in general, have long-term effects. Mm -hmm. And so what we can expect, um, especially in terms of mental health, is that we will continue to deal with the effects of pandemic when it comes to health, wellness, um, and psychological well-being for quite some time, even when we emerge from daily life being affected by COVID-19. Yeah, so we're taking what we knew and, and realizing that it extrapolates and at the same time realizing that there are circumstances now that are pretty, we didn't know what would happen. Um, and, and, you know, it's, I think the thing we also have to say is that you know, we have to assume that if this is what the numbers look like in the general population, this is what they look like in our schools. That's um, what I was thinking, that we have to assume that this is also true in our schools. Yeah. Um, so I got a link from someone. I'll, I'll go ahead and share it in the chat. If you've got a resource that you want to share, absolutely share it in the chat with everyone. Um, and then, Beta, I've got a question for you. So, we know that more of our students may need support next year, but how do we know which ones? Uh, that is always the question, right? Uh, how do we identify those students who do need help? You're always going to have the students, and I and I know that you can think about walking in the hallway and who those students are that that you notice right off the bat. The ones that are easy to spot, the ones who will come up to you and say, "You know what? I'm having a really rough day." 
and kind of just open and, and it gushes out. And it's wonderful that those students are so comfortable sharing. Um, and we want to make sure that we are we are helping and supporting those students. And then there's the other group of students that just aren't easy to identify. They are really trying to hold it together. Maybe that they are more introverted just by nature and they're not going to have a lot of uh, expression just openly in class or even with their friends. Um, but that is also something to look out for. Even small changes in behavior is going to be incredibly important. And they can they can change from the students who are normally uh, kind of extroverted and outgoing and they become quiet or the opposite, students who tend to be introverted and all of a sudden their personality seems to have changed a little bit. Um, but we wanna make sure that we're on the lookout for both of those groups, the easy to spot groups and this, this groups that are more challenging. And that's where students, you know, academic leaders can really support their communities. I like that you pointed out those changes in behavior, because while an older student may be able to say, hey, I'm having a tough day, the way that a younger student might might be telling you that that's happening or that there's something really challenging going on in my head that I'm processing just looks different in younger children. I think we've also got, you know, students who we were previously concerned about. They had a life circumstance that already had them on our radar for one reason or another. Um, caregiver communication. I mean, let's not, not forget that sometimes parents will just tell us too, hey, you know, we have, this year was rough on our family and please, please know this going ahead, which is super helpful. And we want to be encouraging about that. Um, Absolutely. So Kids, you've got some, or Liz, kids, sorry, I just called you my kids. Liz, you also have a description of our processes for student support that kind of helps with those kids who are harder to read. Can you give some strategies for that? Sure. So um, if uh, you heard me talking last spring about what we needed to do to get ready for a year, for a year that was going to start in distance learning. Um, you heard me say that in schools, systems tend to be proximal, informal, and implicit. Um, so what does that mean? Number one is that, we, and this is true of student support systems and especially around mental health. I'm walking down the hallway, you know, I've had advisory in the morning. I see one of my kids. I'm like, oh, she, something seems up. But, you know, I'm on to my ninth grade English class. And then on the way, I pass the counselor and I say, oh, let me grab you for one sec. I didn't have a formal system. That system got triggered by my being proximal to the counselor. I saw them. Um, they are often informal, meaning that we don't typically have a, that schools don't typically have a survey or a mechanism or a meeting that surfaces kids with mental health concerns. They count on the teacher or the advisor or the administrator taking the initiative to, uh, to initiate that process. And the third thing is that they're implicit. And that's that schools typically use a host of systems to surface kids with mental health concerns that have nothing to do with mental health. Um, typically, what that means is that um, whatever kind of um, system you have in place, that, uh, that's your alert system for kids with acad in academic distress, typically tends to be Oh, Leslie, thanks for that great, um, thanks for that great note that's going into the chat. Um, that's a great article from the Times. Um, that what happens is that those academic warning sy uh, systems tend to, again, surface kids who are experiencing challenges that are frequently not based in the academic or, into, or cognitive realms. They're typically, they emerge from external circumstances or emotional challenges. So those systems have all made it, make it harder for us to find kids. Um, and they, they were very hard to replicate when we were all in distance learning mode. Um, but there's, we can actually sort of clump some of these situations together, these kids who fly under the radar. Um, first, kids with low caregiver communication to the school. We've all seen these, right? The parent who, when you reach out, can says like, oh yeah, um, you know what? Uh, that child's older sibling was just in a car accident. Like, oh, thank you. That would explain why, why they're struggling right now. Um, 
Uh, a second one, and this is really important to think about, is that distress does not look the same for every child. And that is can also be deeply affected by students' uh, cultural and racial and ethnic identities. And so educators with low cultural competence, it can sometimes be easy for them not to see signs of distress because they don't follow what their what educators and in independent schools or educators in, in schools in general, educators are predominantly white. And so if you have white faculty who aren't attuned to cultural competencies, mm -hmm. then it's very easy for them to miss kids of color who are in distress. Um, there's also the fact that kids are invested in hiding their pain, right? Right, Adolescents right. often don't want people to know they're struggling. And that's true whether it's academic or emotional or social. You know, there's that piece about what's external and what's internal, very complex. You know, I think for most of us who teach high school or work with high school students, that's part of what draws us to this age. It is the complexity and how rich those emotional and inner and, and exterior lives are. Um, so if kids are invested in hiding their own pain or they're only comfortable showing it to their friends, students also um, have an outsized notion of their ability to help, right? So students often don't go to adults when they should to, um, to sort of to ring the alarm bells. There's also the fact that as educators, we are all exhausted. We are all exhausted. This is the, this is the year that has, you know, disrupted everything. And a lot of educators aren't in very good shape. And when you're managing your own problems or your problems in your family and your challenges, whether they are physical, mental, emotional, relational, it's a lot harder to manage the ones outside. And so people are fatigued. And that doesn't, I also want to be clear that that's not putting blame on folks. That's human. It makes total sense that if you are consumed by very real challenges that are happening for you and your loved ones, it will be harder to look outside yourself. And that's okay. That's what all humans do. Right. And one of the things that I learned most recently in doing some work for one of our courses that we're doing this summer on, um, mm. call it the three R's course, that I spoke with one of our colleagues at MBOA who said employee assistance programs are free, confidential. Your employer doesn't even know that you've accessed those resources and that academic leaners can really play a hand in helping employees who need those find them rather than saying, hey, you might need this. Instead saying, I'm giving everybody at this meeting a copy or I've put a copy in everybody's mailbox and I wanna remind you that this is free and confidential. So I think that's a step that we can take as leaders to help. So Sarah, can I build on that point for a second? Absolutely. Which is just as academic leaders are opening those conversations for their educators and normalizing those conversations, that's one of the ways to, fit, to find kids in distress and to open lines of communication, which is with students and families to be open and direct and to normalize the conversation about mental health. So, um, you know, for example, when, um, when you're talking to a group of families, if you start out by saying, you know, most kids are doing fine, but a few are really struggling. Um, if you are the parent of one of those children who is struggling, you know what? You, you just not, got shot down, didn't you? You just got like, shot down. Yeah. Most kids are fine, you know, so. What's wrong I, with us? What's wrong That's with us? tell anyone. So one of the things yeah. that we are urging folks to school when it comes to, to, to student support is to not, um, to not frame the conversation about needing support as the outlier or the aberration. To simply say, People need all different kinds of support. And we know the year has been hard. So we are here to talk about these things and, and just lay it out there. Um, there's a sense that if, you know, the truth is there is still far too much um, stigma and shame around mental health. Um, and, uh, and so one of the, and students are hungry to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. So the more schools can do to say, hey, 
we have places to talk about these things for you as students. We have places to talk about these things for you as parents to support your children. The more we normalize those conversations, the more the people who need them will walk into them. You know, when we were talking about this before, you also brought up that you know, some of the ways that we see kids in the past and say, oh, you know, this is something I might need to investigate might be harder to find. We've adapted the curriculum. So changes in students' grades might be harder to tell. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You and I have talked before about adaptive strategies becoming maladaptive, but appearing healthy, right? So those color-coded notes may have really crossed over into perfectionism. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um you know, so we talked, I, I mentioned a few minutes ago, systems that are informal, implicit, and proximal. So the more you can build systems and build communications that are explicit, that are, that are regular and systemic, the mm -hmm. more likely you are to open conversations and to, and to make sure that you're, you, you're getting support to the students who need it most. Um, so the first thing is to, again, open the lines of communication, not just in what you can talk about, but in who you're talking to. Um, so mass emails, text alerts, um, they get people information they need, but they don't build trusting relationships. Um, pick up the phone and call. Um, and, you know, those conversations surface issues much more quickly than email does. Um, so, you know, make sure that you're talking through your advisory system and through, um, you know, and through your division heads um, that, that, that you're building those kinds of communications with families and students in, that, that it's not, that it is personal and that you do give folks those openings. Um, Great advice. Yeah. I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've got a, a question for Beta. This is something that we talked about before. Yeah. I want to be sure we cover too, which is what are some of those strategies or systems that we should have in place? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And it, it certainly builds on what Liz was just saying about fostering uh, authentic relationships. And something that you want to do is, is not treat everything like a fire uh, alarm. It's, we're not talking about, a, a, you know, emergencies here because, you know, we want to make sure that we are uh, taking everything in and really listening to our students. But when normally, you know, sorry, I say normally, like, we're going to be in normal times again. But two years ago, if there was something, a topic that maybe came up in advisory and, you know, you, you heard about it from your advisee and, uh, you know, you said, well, I'll check back in with them next week and see if they've resolved it themselves and see how it's going. Don't wait next year we don't want students to feel like they need to fend for themselves and feel like maybe they're floundering for another week. If you need to, we want to move small. Don't, you know, you're not taking the whole team approach and saying to a student, oh, we need to fix this now. I'm going to call all, you know, seven of your teachers together. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about moving small, but moving quickly. And so maybe that means right after advisory, you know that the counselor kind of has a 45 minute block set aside just in case things come up. You could walk with your advisee down to the counselor and just sit there for 10 minutes just so that maybe they get to know a person that they haven't. And then now they know where the counselor's office is. So it's these small first steps that hopefully can therefore have a, an effect that will stop or, or um, help correct something that is happening. So move small, move fast and keep an eye on it. You don't want to, you don't want to wait next year. Yep. And, and I would just put in a plug that the smallest, fastest step you can do is actively listening. Um, Absolutely. It's, it's just, it's listening. Um, so I was lucky enough early in my career to attend the Stanley King um, Counseling Institute and which I'm guessing some other folks um, on here may have been lucky enough to do as well. And one of the things that they would say over and over again is don't just do something, sit there. Um, by which they mean is, is that giving a student the space to talk is doing something. 
listening and responding to what you hear is doing something. It is often the, the smallest, fastest, and most meaningful thing that you can do. Yeah. And it can be hard to do that with a group of students. So invite a student back for lunch, you know, mm -hmm. put, put, put some different, different strategies in and hopefully we can have lunch sitting closer than six feet next year. And we talked about some strategies that schools maybe already had in place that they need to be more intentional or structured about. And one of those was grade level team meetings. And Beta, you had some great ideas for how to make a grade level team meeting effective for identifying kids who may need a little extra. Yeah, it, the more that that we can, that you can build in those kind of systemic components. Um, so grade level team meetings happen, you know, at, a, at regular intervals and you're asking teachers to identify students who um, you feel like haven't seen any signs of concern, those maybe who are in some uh, marginal like yellow area of concern, if you will, and then your students who you're truly concerned about. And this is important, especially when we get to the upper school level, because we don't always see students for more than one class. And we need that insight from all different classes to really understand. So if, if you can get your grade levels together on a regular interval, this can actually be one of those move small but move quickly situations so that it's not come progress reports two, two and a half months into school where based on grades that you think you find out a student is struggling. And the and and you know another thing would be, we we talked about it a little bit earlier, but some advisory systems and being deliberate and intentional about uh, social and emotional learning, and also helping students and helping advisors know what their next steps can be. So what what comes after active listening? Who do you go to? Who do you report to? You know, do you have a grade level dean? Is it your upper school head? You know, who are those people? But making it very clear that if you have a concern, where do you go next? Because, because your teachers and your advisors, they can't hold it all, right? <laughs> they're, they're doing a lot of work. And this really truly does take a team approach. That's great. We've got a couple of great suggestions. Absolutely. Y'all feel free to um, send them to panelists and attendees. There are a couple that just came to the panelists. So I've re, re sent them with credit to the original author. Um, Liz, you've got some systems to recommend too. I love the way you said, make sure that advising isn't just goldfish and donuts. <laughs> I have certainly provided my fair share of donuts and goldfish. Costco goldfish, right? <laughs> They're amazing. Um, and they're dangerous to have around when your advisees don't eat them all. Um, so the, the, we talked about making sure that adults know what to do, but it's also really important to make sure that students know what to do. So um, our colleagues and friends at the Laurel School in Cleveland, for example, um, talk to their students about the big five. These are the five things that you always need to tell an adult about because they mean someone is in danger. And so, um, you know, being really clear, having consistent messages that they hear from every adult, having families know that that's the message that you're giving to students as well. Um, make sure that kids understand that there are some things that they don't have to carry by themselves. Yeah. And then when they come to you, be respectful um, about, about what their concerns are at the same time that you're, you're acting in the best interest of the student. Because if, if kids don't trust you when they bring that information to you, you will stop getting that information. So um, one of the things that, that we hear, that we've heard from a few different schools is saying, listen, this is what I need to do with the information you've brought to me because I care about you. So let's talk through how we can handle that. Do you want to talk to your friend? Do you want us to talk to your friend together? Do you want, you know, like, let's, let's talk through so that the student, even when you say to the student, I can't hold this in confidence, which is, let's face it, why they told you, um, even though they feel really conflicted about it, um, you know, make sure that they, that they have some agency and that there aren't any surprises, even if they don't like what you're going to do, if they know what you're going to do, you've still built some trust there. Yeah. 
Um, so we're running out of time, but we've got a question sent to me that I want to address, which is what about getting students caught up? How does that impact what we should do in terms of social emotional support? And I am so glad that this came in. I recently read an article and I'm going to put it in the chat here about the importance of parts of our curriculum that we might have lost last year. And these have to do with the the group projects, the hands-on activities, the labs. We got to go outside sometimes, but that those close-in activities where kids kind of chat and uh, discover great scientific principles at the same time or build something together in another course. So those foster that relationship in the classroom between student to student and student to teacher. And that has got to come first. I think, you know, when we, we've talked a lot about learning loss and how that is not the term that we want to use and that kids grow differently and there may be some things that we need to backfill, but we are not going to come in next year and say, okay, we're going to move twice as fast and we're still going to drop all of these things because I'm going to quote him and it's in the article that I'm going to share. James Ford, the 2015 North Carolina State Teacher of the Year, yay, North Carolina, said, our first job as teachers is to make sure that we learn our students, that we connect with them on a real level. level. And that's gotta be our first job coming back next year. So I cannot recommend enough taking a look at this particular article and maybe bringing it in for some discussion. So thank you for asking that question. Yep. And you know, students who are in distress can't learn effectively. And building relationships, getting kids what they need is actually the thing that will long-term make learning happen. So that's one of the reasons why kids have had slowed growth this year, because they have been managing so much. The more we can help them effectively process what the past 18 months have been when they come back to, to school in September, the better their learning and the, the better their learning will be and the faster they'll get back on track. I can't think of a more eloquent way to close. Thank you so much. Let's thank you all for coming.